Forward Guidance is brought to you by Van Eck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about Van Eck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very pleased to meet for the first time Rupert of Blind Squirrel Macro. Rupert, uh, wonderful to, to meet you for the, the first time. How are you doing? Thanks. Thanks, Jack. I'm delighted to be on um, slightly early in the day here, but um, I hope I sound, sound wide awake. Really, really great to, to meet you. I've been watching your show since it started and a huge fan. Thank you. I'm also a huge fan of, of yours. And yes, you are recording early in the morning uh, from Australia. So you're here uh, bright eyed and, and bushy tailed. Rupert, how about you tell the audience a little bit about your background in finance and in industry as well? I'm, I'm a recovering investment banker. Um, I spent um, 25 years on the sell side in, in London and in Asia, in Hong Kong. I did most jobs on the private side of the Chinese wall. I started a life as an M&A banker and became a capital markets banker, picked up an interest in derivatives through running a convertible bond business. Um, that turned into a broader derivatives mandate and then ultimately spent the last 10 years of my sell side career mostly taking Asian and mainly Chinese companies public in London and New York. I then spent a few years in industry. I worked for a Chinese electric car startup. And a couple of years ago, um, I moved down to Melbourne, Australia, and where I do a bit of consulting. And I started Blind Squirrel Macro back then. So you were taking Chinese companies public and listing them in Western stock exchanges? Usually on Hong Kong, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange or um, the ADRs on NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. What was that experience like? Tell, tell me about that. It went through a bunch of various cycles in the sort of post GFC era. Well, actually, even in the run up to the GFC era, you had um, a massive bull market in Asian and Chinese stocks. Um, and, you know, the busiest IPO market on the planet for a decade. I mean, I remember being back in London for a while, and it was really only the Asian teams that had an IPO business. Um, you know, European Europe hadn't been doing any IPOs for years during the, during the mid noughties and it goes through cycles. I mean, there was obviously the phase where nobody could get enough China equity, right? Um, and then you have the droughts, but the IPO market in China always used to carry on anyway, even if there wasn't necessarily a huge amount of international demand for the paper, simply because ultimately. If you've established any wealth in China, you only really own it if, you, um, if you've managed to get it offshore. And one of the best ways to get wealth offshore is to have your company um, traded overseas. You know, we went through a phase whereby Chinese deals were getting done, but they were done, getting done in, in an unnatural manner. They, they were known affectionately as friends and family transactions. And then you, we had a, a pretty tricky phase in the sort of the mid 2010s where you either had, you had two types of deal. I mean, in, in, in Hong Kong, Chinese overseas listings are known as A shares or H shares, H shares being the Hong Kong shares, the overseas, or, um, and A shares being the ones listed domestically. And you also have another type of company called a, a red chip, which is a Chinese business that's actually um, domiciled offshore. What's that called? A red chip. Red ship, okay. Yeah, so it'll be a Chinese business that's um, that's established in the Cayman Islands or somewhere else, right? And, and Rupert, is that uh, a Chinese company established in the Cayman Islands? Is that where the type of company where in the prospectus it says, look, we don't actually own this Chinese company, we just have- That's a VIE, which is yeah. the variable interest entity. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a, that's an additional layer of, you know, structuring that comes comes in and yes. You know, on paper, there's not a lot that the owner of a share of shares in a in a, in a VIE um, do actually own. But I, I used to joke that during that phase, um, there was almost an ex um, an, an extra class of Chinese listing, which was the Z share or the zombie share, where the listing had been created in order to establish a foreign listing, and that actually it was usually the chairman and his mates that controlled 100% of the float anyway. But you had two types of deal at that stage. You'd, you'd have these types of friends and family deal going on, and then you'd also have occasionally some really interesting business that would come to the market. And then those stocks would get orphaned in a different way because that would be 
where everyone in the international would wake up, wake up and say, this is an amazing stock, this is an amazing story, and then it would price at sort of stupid times earnings. And it would actually end up getting placed all into China hot money hands instead of you know, regu- regular way, um, institutional hands internationally. And so those stocks used to get orphaned as well. And then, and then, then we'd get a, a cycle back into some, some degree, some degree of normality. The Hong Kong IPO market, I'm afraid is a ghost of what it, what it was 15 years ago. And needless to say, you're, you're not actively involved now in that, in China IPO market. Not really. And actually, I noticed you've had quite a, a couple of quite positive guests on China recently. I was listening to one that you you, you put out yesterday, I think. Yeah, I, I, one very positive, somewhat positive one, which is, you know, I've, I've had on a lot of doom and gloom guests on China. Um, then you had Misery Guts Russell Napier on talking about China the other week. Yeah. I, I, by the way, huge, huge fan of Russell. I mean, I, I mean one of the most frustrating things about um being an Asian expert for a lot of my career was um, I used to visit New York, you know, three or four times a year and get lectured by someone 10 years younger than me in Midtown about how China was doomed and find out how halfway through the conversation that they'd never actually been there. <laughs> and, um, you know, oftentimes the the most negative views were coming from the furthest point in the, on the compass away from um, the, 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 the real story itself. You know, there is, there is no doubt that there are structural issues with the, with the Chinese economy. Um, but writing off 30% of global, global GDP doesn't seem like a smart starting point. Yeah. So I, I want to get your, your current views on China in, in, in a minute. But just to be clear, so back in your days doing initial public offerings and, and basically, you know, helping sell uh, Chinese stocks in, in Hong Kong and list them or, or in the, the rest of the world, who were, was the client base? And, you know, in other words, I have learned that Chinese citizen, Chinese investor, if they have savings, they park their marginal savings dollar much more in real estate than they do in stocks. Whereas in the U.S., definitely more of a, a stock market culture. So, I, who who are sort of the buyers of Chinese stocks internationally and then domestically? So, I mean, I was I was never doing domestic IPOs on Shanghai or Shenzhen, right? So that's a, that's that's a much more much more retail oriented market. Although, as you correctly point out, the 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 unit of saving in China is not, you know, equities necessarily at the top of the list. It is very much real estate at the top of the list. And even if you think about the super wealthy in China, right? It's domestic real estate, then it's overseas real estate if they can get money offshore and then they might start start thinking about other financial assets but the audience for the deals that uh, that I was doing was institutional money around the world and then a growing um a growing pocket of institutional money in China itself and then there was the the, the famous friends and family money that I was talking about which was you know essentially chinese millionaires and billionaires who have access to capital offshore Right, it's a closed capital account, so you're not able to participate in a Hong Kong IPO or a, a, a Nasdaq listed ADR um, unless you've got money offshore. Is that a QFIIN? So QFII is, is is the other way around. I mean, this okay. is the. I mean, it's it's controlled capital account. You can, as a foreign investor, you can you can access domestic A shares as as a foreigner through the northbound Hong Kong Shanghai Connect. Similarly, you can you can as a, as an onshore investor access um, Hong Kong stocks through the Southbound Connect. Unless you're using the Connect, which is a kind of closed loop system, um, you need to be um, a qualified foreign foreign investor, either inbound or outbound. That's a separate level of of regulatory approval. Got it. And then, what is the difference? Between an ADR, like an American depository receipt, something or something listed in the West, and then an onshore stock, like for example, Alibaba, the Western ticker, you know that that we all know is Baba, um, but you know uh, the the actual ticker number is, is it seven hundred? It's it's I think it's no no ten cents is seven hundred. No, seven, no, okay. So this is we are doing the whole Eskimo t- snow description here. Baba was originally listed as an ADR only. Right. Subsequently, a few years ago, when noises were being made about delisting Chinese equities at the sort of um, at the height of the sort of um, 
trade war under the Trump administration. Um, a lot of the big Chinese tech companies started doing what they called the sort of the going home trade, um, where they listed. So an ADR is a depository receipt that represents underlying shares. What they did, what what, what Alibaba did was um, to relist the underlying shares on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So they're the same shares, just in New York, you're buying a depository receipt on the same shares instead of the underlying shares themselves, which are listed on Hong Kong. Okay, okay, got it. So I guess maybe a better question would be, what's the difference between Tencent, the A share onshore, not in Hong Kong, but onshore, Shanghai, I believe, is uh, 700. That's just the, the number. And then- That's the Hong Kong ticker, 700. Both, okay, so there's, there actually is no difference. There is no difference between, uh, well, I mean, Tencent, Tencent doesn't have an ADR. That's a bad example. The distant difference between Baba, right, and whatever the ticker, let me look it up for you here before we drive each other. Mark, I think it is, is it 7888? It is 9988. 9988, sorry. I used to be really good at numerical stop codes. It's something, something that's sort of dipping with age, I think. <laughs> So what's an example of it's complicated because it's not just two but there, there's three like a, an asia well, a, a share is a domestic listing right? right all of the big chinese state-owned banks will have a shares but then yeah. they'll also have an h share in hong kong and so there used to be a um, a big business of if you had the right regulatory approval of arbitrage activity between between, between the a shares and the h shares on hong kong an a share listed domestically on shanghai or shenzhen is 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 just for domestic investors and for qualified foreign investors and is there a risk that non a shares will be treated uh worse off than a shares in other words oh you you know you're a british investor in london Screw you! But okay, oh, you're you're not you're actually a Chinese citizen. Okay, fine. You'll you'll we'll treat you okay. Difficult to answer that question. A company that is a Chinese incorporated company, right, can have an A share listed in Shanghai and an H share listed in Hong Kong. It's two classes of the same share capital, right? I don't think necessarily, you know, you should be worried about discrimination on that front between A and H. I think that where the focus of investor concern really historically has been on the construction of these VIEs, these variable interest entities, which was where essentially corporates of um, corporates that own businesses that were regarded as, you know, quasi strategic assets, right, were listing, if you like, a tracking stock. Yeah, I think the best analog to this is like US tracking stocks. What do you mean a tracking stock? So the way Liberty Media um, quotes Formula One these days, right? That's um, F W O N K. Fonk Fonk um, is is a tracking stock out of it. Now you don't actually what the what the tracking stock is designed to do is to um, give you all of the economics of owning that business, but you don't necessarily have a a lean on the assets of that business that's still sitting within liberty media the variable interest entity is if you like um, a legal construct to give you the same outcome as a tracking stock but they've been around for so long i mean the first vies were were you know were put together in my 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 first tour in asia in the in the late 90s right that's when they that that was when they were first first put together because it was literally the only way to get an overseas listing executed for certain businesses within China at that time. What is your current view of the Chinese equity market, which as most of our viewers will know, is in a very, very difficult bear market, peak to trough declines of around 70%. I still think that there's some really interesting businesses there. You know, the the drawdown led by the, the real estate market has, um, well, firstly, the anti-corruption clamp down, then the sort of cram down on the tech monopolies, and then the real estate has, you know, has been a triple whammy for that market. But you're at this this point now where there is almost, I mean, there's, there's negligible foreign institutional participation in the market beyond, you know, people there for a trade. You've got global emerging market dollars all crowded into Indian equities, when historically they would have been, you know, 10 times bigger in China. 
as a few people have said very smartly, you know, it, it, all you need is for that market to go from dire to slightly less dire. And you could hear this enormous sucking sound of offside liquidity moving back into, into that market. I mean, it could be spectacular to the upside. In terms of, you know, the broader picture about sort of owning the market for 10, 15 years, the the classic, well, could this go the same way as Russian equities, et cetera? I'm a little bit more sanguine about that. But then again, I'm, you know, I'm not a, a fiduciary managing um, pension fund money out of Minnesota, right? Um, so I, I, I look at things um, through a different through a different prism. Um, I've spent half of my adult life in um, Asia, so I'm going to have naturally much more comfort with the with the risk there. But you know, I I know that Hong Kong, where I spent much of my uh, my working life, is not the place that um, that I arrived first in 1998, and it's certainly not the same place. But at the same time, I'm 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 more relaxed about the overriding um, the overriding you know, macro risks there. And so on your blind scroll macro sub stack, I'm looking at your model port portfolio and I'm- Please don't view it as a model model portfolio. I really, I'd really try not to position myself as as giving sort of asset allocation. I and mean, what I do is I track the individual trade ideas um, that I that I write up. Um, and so that's my, that's my scorecard is, 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 is on it on an individual idea basis rather than a portfolio basis. But Sorry, yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you. And then may, may I ask, is, does your personal portfolio have a lot of these ideas in it as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I only write about things that I'm doing myself. Got it. Okay, so I'm looking at your scorecard. And I think the only China thing I see is Prosys, which I believe is a Dutch entity, which owns a lot. Yeah, so that's 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 a that's a, a cheap way into Tencent. Amazing story. So um, it's a bit like Massasan and Alibaba. Right, Naspers, which was a South African media company, ended up owning a very large stake in Tencent through a fantastic deal um, 25 years ago. Um, and for years, the Naspers Tencent stub trade was one of the big sort of risk arb trades. Um, and you know, Naspers, because of its Tencent holding, ended up becoming a huge um, part of the Johannesburg Exchange. Eventually. What Naspers did was to spin their stake in Tencent plus all of their other private and public tech investments into an Amsterdam listed holding company called Process. Um, but the guts of Process is still their stake or their residual stake in Tencent. And they still trade at quite a steep discount, is that correct? I mean, essentially, you get all of the other stuff, which is stuff that you might or might like or loathe, but you're getting it for free. I got into that trade in October of 22. Um, that was the bottom. Yeah, I, I, I bought the bottom. Um, I, I took I took quite a lot of it off about a year ago, and um, which is why it's it's still it's, it's it's a China trade that's still in the green, right? But there's not a lot of value for um, value to the stuff that I didn't sell a year ago. Why is that the only Chinese stock that's a trade idea? Basically, I, ha I had a go last year at a at a, at a, a long China short India pair, which I got yep. stopped out of. Um, it's still a trade that is absolutely top of my watch list um, for the reasons that we discussed a moment ago. I think that if China does go on a bull run, it's going to come at the expense of a very expensive Indian, a very crowded and expensive Indian equity market. Um, I do. I do think that India is, in the context of global emerging markets, priced for absolute perfection right now. I think there's a huge amount of uninformed optimism about the way in which the um, country is being run. I look at a currency that has been a serial devaluer over years. If you look at a, a monthly chart of the USD INR, I mean, it just it's just a country that is just a currency that always wants to go down. Um, I look at the reliance on imported energy. I look at the fragility of um, Indian agriculture. It only, and things go pear shaped pretty quickly if they have a bad monsoon. We had one. We had one, you know, last year. Um, Thirty percent of exports are in the IT services, business process, outsourcing space. If there is a space which is likely to get disrupted by artificial intelligence. Back offices in Bangalore feel feel, feel ripe as a um, as a target there, and all it would take 
is um, a bit of shift in confidence around Chinese equities, and I know where that's getting funded. It's a trade that didn't work when I tried to put it on at the towards the end of the summer last year. I got stopped out of that, but it's a trade that I absolutely expect to put on again. Uh, how bad do you think the ongoing Chinese real estate issues are? Maybe we can call it call it a crisis. And what do you think the potential knock on effects of, of that would be on the economy? I feel that we've seen the worst, and that there's a, there's going to be an ongoing there's going to be an ongoing grind. It's funny. I mean, for almost as long um, as I was in Hong Kong, people were calling the top in Chinese real estate, and um, and it was a complete widow maker, shorting Evergrande. I mean, I, 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 I mean, shorting Evergrande was is one of the original widow makers, along with short JGBs and short Aussie banks. Right, it's it's you know, the the great the great widow maker in macro, and you know all of those guys, super smart guys, were absolutely right. But you know, I'd say ninety five percent of the people that been negative on Chinese real estate never made any money on that view. Then it came, then it came hard and fast. It may be the light of the train at the end of the uh, the other other end of the tunnel, but I am seeing a bit of light. Um, what's the light that you see? Tell tell me more about that. Well, no, no, the, the glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel may, may be an oncoming train again, but I, I am seeing some light. We're at a point at the, on the path where I can see, I, I can see some, some degree of recovery. But ultimately, you know, the construct that we were just talking about with Chinese wealth predominantly being held in real estate ultimately is, 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 is not really healthy. I mean, you've got, um, you've got, you've got an economy that, you know, has been, the factory to the planet, and I think will continue to be the factory to the planet, but where there hasn't been a natural domestic consumption market. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, that is something that happens to all economies ultimately. And I don't see why it's not going to happen in China with time. My friend Kevin Muir wrote a really interesting piece um, um, the other day about HUCO reform. This is the system in China whereby your rights to state services are determined by your residency, right? And um, so, you know, for example, in a in a mega city like Shanghai, only a very small percentage of the population actually has hukou status, where they're entitled to the childcare and healthcare that comes with that, which means that a huge part of um, the population in expensive cities has to, you know, deploy huge amounts of their disposable income towards stuff that, you know, elsewhere in the world they would they would get from the state. Um, if if we do, and caveat that people have been talking about HUCO reform for a very long period of time, if that does happen, you know, that could have a massive impact on domestic consumption, which is really what the what the China economy needs. Well, we're uh, already, you know, a, a little bit in ways into our interview. We've just just talked about China. <laughs> <laughs> I love, we've spent half an hour talking about something that I really haven't been writing about at all for the past year. <laughs> but but it's still very important. I mean, I you know, I'm glad to have your somewhat bullish view uh, on because for so long I've had just only China bears, which is a view that has worked out. But uh, you know, I, I I will be glad to have. Both my, uh, you know, my, my both both sides on, on this program. I'll be hedged. Yeah, abs ab absolutely. I, I think. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't categorize myself as a China bull, but I am. I'm. I'm more inclined to be drawn to a positive China narrative, because ultimately, I'm. A, I'm a value bore at the end of the day. There are some excellent companies trading at spectacularly cheap valuations um, right now, and if it goes. Even if it half goes, it's going to be a phenomenal money-making opportunity. In 2017, Forward Guidance's exclusive sponsor, Van Eck, was the first ETF issuer to file for a Bitcoin-linked ETF. Seven years later, Bitcoin ETFs are finally available. Using the Van Eck Bitcoin Trust ticker HODL, you can invest in Bitcoin with zero fees until March 31st, 2025. That's right, zero fees until March 31st, 2025. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today or visit vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more.
Now, the disclosures. An investment in the Vedic Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL, involves significant risk and may not be suitable for all investors. You could lose your entire investment. The Trust offers fewer investor protections as it is not registered under the Investment Company Act of 1940 or as a commodity pool under the Commodity Exchange Act. For a complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the Trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. You can learn more about HODL and its zero fees until March 31st, 2025 at vanek.com slash hodlfg. That's vanek.com slash hodlfg. And now back to the interview. Rupert, you, uh, we, we talked about your investment banking career, uh, doing IPOs in, in China. Tell us about how you got involved in the electric vehicle business, which is something you also have an immense amount of experience with and an uh, informed view on it. You know, you know, you actually have, have been there. So how did you get into ele- electric vehicles and what was your experience like? So via a former client um, of mine as a, as a banker, um, I ended up as chief strategy officer of a Shanghai-based electric vehicle startup, which um, which is called WM Motor. It doesn't really exist anymore. Um, ultimately, we were a pure EV company. Um, the um, we had well, when I left, we had two and a half factories. Um, we were making all electric city SUVs. Um, we had three models out at the time. But I was absolutely in the chaotic cauldron of China EV world in, you know, let me timestamp this in 2018, 2019, 2020, that, that, that starting late 2018. Um, you know, at that point in time, I think there were something like 400 Chinese EV startups um, going on. Obviously, there are, there are the names that people will recognize now are um, names like um, Neo, Xiaopeng, Li Auto. At that time, BYD was really focused on primarily on its battery business, um, and now it is the eight hundred pound gorilla in global EV that we that that we all know. And so, the whole China electrification story made perfect sense to me, which is why I was so attracted to it. Because ultimately, you know. There was a obviously Tesla was going on in the West, um, and it was a sort of a lifestyle. It was it was a lifestyle sort of pro planet kind of vogue that was going on in China. The whole electrification story made perfect sense from a geopolitical and industrial logic perspective. China is massively a massive importer of energy. That is a strategic headache for the country. So, you know, being a massive consumer of gasoline um, is, um, is, is a problem. Secondly, and this is an environmental point, by the time you got to the late 90s, early 2000s, air quality in the coastal Chinese cities like Shanghai and Shenzhen, I mean, you know, when I, when I first used to go to Shenzhen in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was like, um, it was like driving into the Blade Runner set. You know, if you were catching an early morning uh, flight from out of Shenzhen Airport, you know, you, you, you'd, you'd cross the border up from Hong Kong and in, into, into the smog. Now, China's not a democracy, but, you know, the Communist Party controls China, at, you know, at the will of the people, right? And if, um, you know, if, if mothers in Shanghai uh, getting frustrated that their two-year-olds have asthma or chronic asthma, you know, this becomes, you know, the, the whole livability index of these, you know, megalopolises on the, on, the, on, the, on the eastern seaboard of China just became a real issue. So I, I don't think it should be underplayed. And the third point is, is, is what, we're, what, we're, what we're reaping right now, which was the industrial logic. Now, China, in case you hadn't noticed, is really good at making things. You know the highest the highest value item on any household expenditure outside of the house itself is is a car. And you know I think it's a source of of, of, of real frustration that the the, the the Chinese auto industry had never caught up with the Japanese or the German or or, or, or the or the U.S. These players were always a step ahead in um, R and D in development on the internal combustion engine, and so. They went, okay, EVs really work for us strategically for reasons one and two. And so they pitched headlong into um, getting ahead of the game in terms of 
battery technology, the supply chain, the material supply chain around the lithium ion battery. And, um, you know, fast forward to where we are now, um, you, you, you've, got, you've got the Chinese EV industry in a, in a relatively unassailable position right now. And so we've got this situation whereby, you know, BYD can put a $10,000 EV on the road. You know, ultimately, the rest of the world has been, you know, you know, hoping that, you know, retail subsidies would bail them out, hoping that, um, hoping that, you know, a new administration would take the foot off the throat in terms of transform, transforming the industry. And, and uh, anyway, they've just been completely left behind. I think that, you know, politicians in the West are now, you know, in this unenviable position of being worried about inflation. Um, but at the same time, you know, China's producing these really cheap EVs, which they want people to be, be people to be driving on their roads. Um, and, you know, the domestic versions of these things are going to be too expensive. And, um, you know, I think we could see a, a massive bloodbath in in mass market EVs, I'm I'm more positive around you know the luxury end of the spectrum, but in 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 you know in the core mass market where the lion's share of the units are manufactured and sold, um, I can't see a situation in which you know China isn't dominating that market. Yeah, we're going to see some protectionism. We're going to see a lot more protectionism out of the EU, out of, out of the US. Of course, we've got plenty of elections this year. That may delay the inevitable. In the meantime, these cars are they're on the road here in Australia. They're, they're going to be sold into Latin America. They're going to be sold into, you know, they're going to be sold into the, the Eastern Bloc. They're going to be sold into Africa. They're going to be sold into the rest of Asia. You know, the manufacturing capacity is there. Um, yes, you know, arguably there is excess manufacturing capacity in China, but the EV plants haven't been built yet in the rest of the world. So, I mean, I, I, I don't see a scenario in which, um, you know, China Auto isn't here to stay. And it's not just electric vehicles. I was in an Uber the other day um, here in here in Melbourne, um, and it was a um, it was a model made by Great Wall, um, which is a, a China a Chinese OEM, a, a model called the Haval. It was a family SUV, um, not not sort of American size SUV, but sort of non American non American size SUV on the road for forty five thousand Aussie dollars. Um, it was a hybrid, right? Uh, it's just a, a, regu a regular hybrid. 45,000, call that 30,000 US dollars, was kitted out like a high end EV in terms of 360 cameras, um, fit and finish build, immaculate. Um, now that's going to have Toyota worried, right? Um, Toyota is viewed as almost a domestic brand down here in Australia. They sponsor the they sponsor the footy league for God's sake. Um, but the um, you know this this is this is um, it's not uh, my point here is it's it's not just the the all electric vehicles. Those have been, if you like, the the lead product to to prosecute new markets. Um, but they've got they've got a suite of um, of hybrids, plug in hybrids, and even conventional ICE vehicles coming in behind that. So ICE is internal combustion engine. What we traditionally think of, you know, as a car that that takes in gasoline, uh, EV electric vehicle. So when you said there, there's going to be a bloodbath in the auto market because Chinese cars, Chinese produced cars, are just so competitive, and, it's just competitive. And, and cheap. Either the politicians going to have to double, triple, or whatever tariffs to allow their domestic industries to remain competitive, right? Which may be the outcome, but it's a, it's a pretty inflationary outcome. Or you're just going to see a lot more Chinese cars on the roads everywhere. And so, who would be the victims of you know an immensely cheaply produced series of cars from from China? I, I presume you know Ferrari is exempt because you said it's it's mostly on the middle market. But but is it? I mean, is it everyone other than you know Ferrari and Aston Martin? Full disclosure: I have I have um, one auto 
stock in my personal portfolio right now, which is Mercedes Benz. I own that on um, it was it was my cheeky play on vehicle electrification um, when I when I initially wrote it up about a year ago. Um, it was a piece was called Ben Graham's Electric Vehicle, and the um, the premise behind that is that um, Mercedes is pivoting away from mass luxury to become much more of a luxury brand, um, and I do think that the likes of the Ferraris and aspirationally the Mercedes Benzes of this world will be able to take themselves above, uh, raise themselves above what is going to be what I forecast to be a bloodbath in 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 mass market. Conventionally, automotive OEMs have um, traded at about one to 1.3 times forward sales over, and you can look at it over the cycles. In recessions, they dip below, dip below one times. Um, you know, in 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 a strong buoyant economy, they'll they'll get up to 1.3 times. And then you've got Ferrari tra- trading 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 like an AI stock, and oh, actually, to be fair, trading like an LVMH, trading like a luxury stock. And I think there is scope for. Mercedes to make that transition out of auto AM into into luxury stock. I also like the idea of owning BYD. I mean, the first stock as soon as as soon as China starts to trend, um, you know, I, you know, we've um, we, we you, you can only give yourself so many opportunities, so many goes at catching knives in a given year. And I I'm I'm happy to lose a couple of fingers every so often, but ultimately. You know, I'm 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 waiting for for China to kind of show me, um, but BYD will be top of my shopping list. I'm t- BYD is spectacularly cheap um, right now relative to the gorilla that they are in global auto. Yes, I, roughly the same price and market cap as they were three years ago, but they produce many multiples of the cars and revenues. Absolutely, their growth has, has been extraordinary. I mean, the the stock that I'm really kicking myself about not owning is Toyota. While I was working in the industry, what was what was extraordinary to me is that there was this constant nagging going on in the back of my mind because I was I was trying to raise money from both institutional investors and from strategic investors for our business, and you know I was constantly speaking to bankers in Tokyo saying, you know, I really want to understand what um, what the Japanese OEMs are doing, not just in China but in electric vehicles generally, and and. Toyota, I mean, ultimately, you know, understood uh, has understood more about lithium-ion battery technology um, than anyone else for longer than anyone else. the The Toyota Research Institute is, you know, has been at the forefront of automotive technology, and that's from everything to fuel efficiency through to um, autonomous driving. These guys, these 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 the, these guys are the skunk works of auto, right? And they were there, sitting on their sitting on their hands, doing nothing, right? During this period, going and you know, you know, they kind of used to show up at the car shows in Geneva and Detroit with their rinky-dink little hydrogen mire, and they go, "Why are they doing that? Hydrogen's not the answer." And I thought, you know, I th- we all thought it was a kind of look over here strategy. We, you know, we we just want to milk the advantage we've got in hybrid tech with you know the phenomenally successful Prius, right? And we want to milk that for as long. And I, actually, they were they were sticking to their guns. They were saying, you know what, I'm not entirely convinced that pure lithium, I pure BEVs, is the answer for passenger vehicle technology of the future. And you know, if you look at their annual report now, I mean, I they 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 they, they don't call it an annual report. I can't remember it's, but but the, the, they once a year they put out a one hundred and twenty page document, which is fascinating it's re- it's a really good read but now they're just beginning to say the quiet bit out loud which is a massive told you so to the world around around hybrids a massive what sorry sorry what a massive t- i told you so to oh. the world about hybrids being a superior long term technology i mean if you look at i mean if you just run the basic numbers of converting the global passenger vehicle park that's park with a c in total cars on the road to 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 lithium batteries there's 
you know, no one's thought through the environmental consequences of that transformation. You know, if you've got literally millions of 70 kilowatt hour battery backs that need to be produced, you know, yeah, there is enough, there is enough lithium on the planet. There is, a, there's potentially enough of the other um, battery metal metals available, but I'm not sure that we're all comfortable living with the consequences of mining that quantity of that stuff that needs to produce those batteries. And so, you know, having these incredibly efficient petrol engines supported with smaller battery packs, which is what hybrid technology is, may end up looking like the greenest solution of the lot. Um, um, and anyway, getting back to the stock, I mean, I'm really cross with myself for, I mean, I mean if you just look at Toyota, yes, for most of, um, for most of, um, last year it was really just trading in line with the Nikkei and I think there was a lot of a lot to do with Bank of Japan ETF buying that could explain away some of the performance of Toyota but if you look at what it's done so far year to date I think real money has suddenly noticed that their long game around um, electrification has been the smart one it's now looking quite pricey as a stock, and I don't own it right now. But if we saw any kind of any kind of pullback to a longer term trend line, I'd be all over it. I mean, I'm, I just look on Google Finance, and it says its PE ratio is is eleven. Is that what you consider pricey, or is that eleven not representative? I tend not to look at uh, at PEs. I'll, I'll get I'll get my I'll get my sheet up now. I've got my. Are you, you're in a EV to EBITDA kind of guy? Actually, funnily enough, for for auto, Jack, um, I, I look at I look at I look at um, EV to sales. I'll, ultimately, I I've found that EV to sales for auto OEMs has been the most reliable multiple to look at over over the years. Uh, but yeah, price to sales first, um, EV EBITDA second. And, and Rupert, to tell us about price to sales because. You know, as you know, many people in the investment business uh, have gotten burned using that metric, saying, for example, oh, some low quality stock has a price to sales ratio of uh, 0.2, and NVIDIA has a price to sales ratio of 40. So, you know, uh, I'm going to go with the low quality stock when, you know, it doesn't basically it doesn't take into account profit margins and uh, free cloud for generation and growth and, and indebtedness and, and the, the like. So it, we know it doesn't work very well in the broad investment universe. Why do you think you found that it works uh, better in the OEM car business? Listen, I'm, I'm a sort of classically trained corporate financier. Right? I, was, I was sort of beaten up with Brilliant Myers as a junior banker. And, you know, I've, I've sort of built comparable companies tables in the days before, you know, Coifin and Google and Bloomberg built them for you. You know, we, we used to have to go to the corporate finance library and um, get a selection of brokers' loads and historical annual reports, and, and it would take it would take literally a week to build a comp comparables company table. Something that I can pull together in thirty seconds now um, with the software that we have. I mean, I think it's right to look at various sectors with different different multiples, and it is just for me. The OEM, the auto OEM sector has, it's been less noisy looking at price to sales for that sector over, over the years. All of the, as, as you drop down the income statement and look at multiples further down, you've got various industrial and jurisdictional, whether that's tax, accounting, um, whatever, that, that create additional noise as you go down the income statement. But, you know, ultimately, with the automotive with the automotive industry you know it's a very clean revenue line you've got units times selling price right and um and and and, and that's 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 pretty universal you don't have a bunch of made up stuff like you do in the financial sector oh uh, yeah and uh, listen I, I i you you're familiar with my stuff i get pretty grumpy about adjusted ebitda metrics and um adjusted adjusted earnings metrics i mean you know, it's it's um, what what's amazing is that the market has started to trade on earnings before everything, um, and I think that is that's potentially a um, you know a psychological um, shift 
that's waiting to happen, a normalization of this earnings before everything is that there'll be there'll be a moment in time where everyone wakes up and goes, actually, you know what, we should be looking at gap earnings again. Right. Yeah. And there's gonna be there's there's gonna be a, a a massive adjustment in the market because there are so many players in the market that have never known anything else. Right. If you're if your career in finance started post the GFC, right? You've never known anything else. You've never never known interest rates either, apart yeah, from yeah. The well, they're learning about it now. I'm 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 having to to learn uh, now. Rupert, tell us about the tremendous amount of electric vehicle companies that went public during the bubblicious days of 2020 and 2021. You know, I could name names, uh, some of which you've written about Rivian. Uh, Lucid, uh, Faraday Future. Oh, I'll tell you a funny story about Rivian. Um, I was um, I was pitching pitching my little company at the Detroit Auto Show um, in the middle of January. God, Detroit in January is miserable. Um, it this is a timestamp. This has been January 2019, um, and. Bless them. Deutsche Bank was putting together a, a, a one-on-one schedule for a private Chinese EV company in the U.S. at that time. It was that was hard yards for them, but they they did a great job. And I was in you know how these things work. I was in one of those um, hotel bedrooms converted to meeting room setup in the MGM in Detroit. Yep. yep. And there would be a mainstream for the conference, and um, R.J. Scarringe, the CEO of Rivian, was box office listen it was standing room only in the in the detroit ballroom and i i was sort of green with envy at the uh, uh, you know he just he just announced a private raise from amazon and from ford uh, and, and and i, and I uh, he was the reason i was getting really tough phone calls from the boss in shanghai so what you know what, what why can't we get a bit of love from jeff bezos um <laughs> and um you know, and, and I sort of disappear with my tail between the leg up to up to 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 to, to take my one on one with someone with sort of ten million dollars under management in Wauwatosa, <laughs> Wisconsin, or something like that. Um, but it was um, the. I mean, I actually. I mean, the, the the Rivian truck is a is a beautiful product. Whether or not it can ever be made profitably is something that I'm deeply deeply suspicious of um but i was i was always i was was always kind of rooting for rivian as 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 an asset because they they'd done everything right beyond you know a positive gross margin um the what i call the sort of spac nonsense around that sort of 2010 was was actually a source of profound irritation because the you know the the spac rules that were allowing you know sponsors and management teams to say what they like i mean you know my background 25 years as a corporate financier right i mean we were terrified of forward looking statements and everything that came with these spac rules sort of ran anathema to everything that i'd been brought up doing raising money for corporates um and being in the industry and knowing just how improbable those forward-looking statements were, but then seeing the gullibility of the market in believing them, it was it was completely obvious to me that they were all zeros at that point. But you know, and and you know, <laughs> I wasted a lot of put premium with that view at that uh, over that period of time um the market was able to stay irrational for a lot longer than i was able to remain solvent in that trade um ultimately you know then you had the high profile scandals of you know rolling trucks down hills with with nicola, nicola. Uh, yeah. and um but all of all of the other ones i mean so whether it's the Fiskers or the Lucids or whatever, you know, I was out there competing for the same, the same investor dollars at the same time, and you know, I knew those stories pretty well. And um, you know, what the mania of twenty twenty was able to do with those pretty threadbare stories, let's be frank, um, was 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 extraordinary. 
Um, so it's like it's it's a bit it's a bit of a bit of a bit of a bit of a just a sort of a bad dream, which is sort of coming home to roost right now. I, you know, I, I really think that um, you know most of these most of these assets are you know are just going to be sold for scrap for patents here, a bit of technology there. Um, but I still get, I still get, I still get phone calls from people, um, given, given my background, I get phone calls from people saying, listen, we've got this guy, he used to design cars for Porsche. Um, he's got this concept around a ultra luxury, all electric sports car. Um, who do you think we should speak to about raising some money for them? I mean, this, this hasn't stopped, right? Yeah, and you, you say, uh, do you have a time machine? Go back three years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. To paint a picture for the audience of you know my rudimentary understanding of the electric vehicle market, the first leader in electric vehicle only, EV only, is obviously uh, Tesla. You have the new Chinese you know entrance, which you and you know, many other smart people view as very formidable. You have the Europeans who are old school, uh, you know, I, um, internal combustion engine. Uh, providers, they're getting into the electric vehicle game. Then you have the American internal combustion engine producers for GM getting into that game. And then you have the second brand, so not Tesla's, but original uh, uh, you know, electric only companies. And so we just talked about those companies that- I, I was talking about the, the EV only startups. Yes. Um, and that's frankly, Tesla. Most, most of those are zeros, right? Most of those are zeros. What's your view on Tesla? It's a car company and it's a very expensive car company. I have been involved on the short side in Tesla in the past. I'm not currently involved. Um, ultimately, you know, the shorts have had a really good run of late. I don't think they're done yet. Um, I um, I just prefer not to have Elon Musk occupying any brain space. I mean, it's the original meme stock, and I have a very I have a very firm rule, which is I I don't I don't muck around with meme stocks. You know, because I'm a curmudgeonly form of corporate finance here probably but you know they don't obey the normal laws of physics and um being caught in squeezes is you know is is a count ending um if you if 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 you if you if you get it wrong i mean there are some people with bigger balls than me that are you know out there selling calls on meme stocks and i mean ultimately the way the way I operate is is I mean, given where I am, time zone, most time zone wise, most of what I do in markets is is with stuff that's traded during your day, and so particularly at this time of year, our winter, your your, your our winter, your summer, um, I have set an alarm to do something during U.S. market hours, and I find that's a really good discipline. That is actually probably pretty healthy. So you're, no, you're not, I, I, I definitely find, I mean, obviously you can tell from my background, I'm, I'm British originally, but I find that when I'm in Europe and therefore US markets are open for half of my waking day, I tend to do more stupid shit. Yes. Right? And, and actually the discipline of making an appointment to trade is one that serves me very well. Now, now people that have make really good livings being more actively in the market every single day. Yep. That's their style. That's for them. Um, but getting back to meme stocks, if you're going to be in the blame in in the game of sort of f- reading reading the sort of retail pulse, and and we know it's not really all retail as well. Um, reading reading the pulse of what's going on in those kind of names, they well, you, I I would need to be up all night. Apart from, apart from being sort of slightly uncomfortable with the whole game anyway, because it just doesn't operate to normal laws of physics. The, the meme stock game, you mean? Yes. I, that that makes sense. Well, yeah, you're definitely not involved with meme coins, then. You know, cr- the crypto. <laughs> well, I, I I was a bit shocked when you slid into my DMs last week and tried to <laughs> sell me Pepe nine one one coin. Yes, uh, that that as you know, that was not me. I got I got I got hacked. And, uh, I know it was Jack. I plotted, plotted your history with crypto with interest. <laughs> what about old school car manufacturers? Ford, GM. Stellantis, Volkswagen that, that have gotten into the G, uh, electric vehicle game. What do you think about their prospects? I, I think they're really tough. I mean, the, the the problem is is that none of them can put together an a, an electric offering where they're making a a positive gross margin. Um, 
you know, we've seen even with the beautiful Ford Lightning, right? We've seen Ford struggle to 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 make and sell that car profitably. Um, I I think that all of those big names in classic OEM have got too much exposure to the mass market, which I think is where you know the biggest mess is going to be. I just want to stay well away. Now I think there are other ways to to play to play auto related i i've been i'm i'm very interested in the tire sector for example because i think it's a it's a it's a really interesting play on nominal revenue growth in a in a world where you know tires are not a discretionary purchase um at the end of the day when they go bald you got to change them um the the tire manufacturers operate on margins which are frankly so skinny they're not going to get any tighter because otherwise <laughs> they won't bother making them anymore um but where the value of a tire is going to go up and this is i mean it, it, it you know all road all roads lead back to electrification again um i wrote a you know probably my most successful um theme this year has been the US oil refiners. Um, and, you know, this is a classic sort of monopoly in the making, you know, hated sector, you know, owning, owning, owning an oil refiner was the equivalent of clubbing a baby seal as far as ESG was concerned. And, um, but US has not built a new oil refiner since 1977. That was when the original Star Wars came out. Right. Uh, And, you know, the sector has consolidated around a small handful of independent players. Right. And um, and it's a sector which is spectacularly well managed because it's a really tough industry to get right. Um, And a sector that really cares about capital allocation. And Elliot, Paul Sillinger's Elliot's been very successfully breathed down the, the neck of Marathon Petroleum. He's now on the case with Philip 66. Um, and these guys are classic cannibals. They're buying back their stairs. Now, why do I bring up the refiners apart from to sort of showcase a winner is um, the tire industry, right? You know that 60, 60% of the content of a, of a tire is synthetic rubber, which comes from, from it's a byproduct of the refining process. Right now, the, the tire industry um gets most of most of its um synthetic rubber from the refiners for, for nothing right because refiners make all of their money from selling gasoline right that's where that's where the the true source of their margin comes from now if ICE cars are being pushed off the road gasoline demand drops we still need these refiners to carry on operating because we're not going to stop having a plastics industry. We're not going to stop having a tire industry. You know, your $600 for a set of four new tires could pretty quickly become $4,000, right? And this is a cost plus pass through business tires. You know, the, you know the, the, the growth in the top line for those businesses you know, and that's just ignoring the effects of inflation for now. And you know, I'm 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 a bit of an inflation bull, but I, I you know I think just just the industry structure effect, you know, could see some spectacular nominal revenue growth for the tire industry. And you know, there's been I mean, there's been some sort of nonsense antitrust moves against the tire makers recently. I mean, I just don't understand how. They can be accused of cartel pricing when their margins are as wafer thin as they are. I mean, you know, <laughs> if, if they really are monopolists, then they really should be making a lot more money than they are. Yeah, just to give people a, a sense of how bad this business has been, I'm looking at Goodyear, uh, one of the largest tire, or not actually not one of the largest, but it, it is definitely well, a major. I mean, it, it, it's the U.S. player. Right, it's the and, US player, and yeah. So in 1984, their stock price was twelve dollars and uh, seventy cents, and now their the stock price is thirteen dollars and forty two cents. So, you know, what's that? A, a one less than a one percent return? You probably find that they've issued a ton of shares since then as well. So it's it's not really a it's not really a like for like. Well, I think it's an interesting turnaround story. It's a four billion. I mean, 
can four billion dollar market cap for the U.S. tire producer? Okay, just, I mean, they um, they also they're in the midst of a restructuring. They've got a new CEO um, who used to be the chief operating officer of Stellantis. They've got Elliot breathing down their neck. That you know, follow <laughs> seem to be following Paul Singer around everywhere recently. But um, they um, they've got Elliot taking an activist position. Elliot was behind the recent restructuring that they announced at the end of last year. Um, they are selling off a bunch of assets um, with this new CEO who's got a compensation package, which um, makes him a very very wealthy man if he pulls off even half of. Um, Paul Singer's laundry list of things that he wants seeing done. So um, I, um, I'm long a basket of the big big five global tire players. So Pirelli, Michelin, Bridgestone, Goodyear, um, and also Continental in Germany. But that's that's actually been the underperformer in the basket because they've got a lot of non-tire business. Um, in their sort of auto tech, they they they've actually got quite a big um, com- component business around um, ADAS driver assistance technology um, and other sort of smart techie bits around around the modern car. So the the tire story is a little bit diluted, but um, I think that the biggest upside in that basket is probably the Goodyear story with this turnaround. I think they're going to get serious about capital allocation as well. And so I'm just looking at Goodyear's net income, and it seems like you know sometimes they make money, sometimes they lose money. So is, is it fair to say it's a cyclical business that sometimes or often loses money? You think the the future, based on the fundamentals you, you said, is just going to be much better than the past, and the, the market cap doesn't appreciate that now? I, I don't think the market cap reflects that at all. Um, right now, I think that the new CEO um, did it what we call in, in Britain a kitchen sink job um, with the last set of earnings. Every last bad number would have been stuck into that um, full year full year earnings number. Um, if you look at the initial gap in earnings, if you look if you've got a chart up now, there now the there was a what, a nine ten percent gap down. It, that gap post earnings has now closed. I'm actually really excited about an entry level here. Um, and that gap has closed a lot quicker than I was expecting it to. When I when I wrote my note on the sector, I said I, I, I did say, listen, watch out. We've got a new CEO coming out with his maiden earnings mm-hmm. in a couple of weeks' time. You may want to hold your breath. I'm going to track it from here, but... <laughs> so he was- wants the worst possible first release so that everything subsequent to oh, yeah, that no, no. So, so, so i mean it's 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 the classic arsonist firefighter approach it's like if you get a d in in the fall semester if you get a c in the spring it's a it's an upgrade absolutely <laughs> most improved kid but 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 the the economic incentives are there as well right so it'll his 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 his, his rses will pay out on a formula that is you know time stamped on the lows rupert also on your scorecard, I see a lot of offshore uh, oil drillers. Tell us about what motivated uh, that thesis there, and why are you, you bullish on uh, an industry which, over the past decade, has not performed well? I think it's fair to say. Oh, listen, I I, I think that all it takes is a few um, bloody bankruptcies for um, management teams to get religion around how to operate these things. The wonderful thing about my scorecard is that I I have been long the offshore names. I mean, Valaris out of bankruptcy. Um, I've um, owned, I've been in and out of Transocean for years. Um, I love the um, the OSV plays, the PSV plays like Tidewater. Um, Weatherford I've owned for a long time. I published my Acorn report on offshore with a huge degree of trepidation last September, right? Having owned these things, you know, oh God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jinx this if I write about it now. And I was also a bit concerned that, and frankly, you know, 
there are a lot of very noisy people on Twitter talking about the offshore services sector. I mean, smart, super smart, don't get me wrong, super smart people. And I, I think it's a really interesting space. But throughout last summer, I was beginning to think, God, is this getting a little bit crowded? And um, I saw a tweet, which was a picture of the Barclays Energy Conference last September, where Transocean was presenting to an empty room. I think it was Transocean. I can't quite remember. I think I saw that, yeah. I went, oh my God, there's nobody there. I said, right, I am definitely writing this up now. This is it. Then what happened, I sort of, I published it and my subscriber base grew by about a thousand overnight. And I thought, oh crap, this really is crowded. And then, um, and I was, I was thinking, oh God, oh God, I've really, I've really called the top on this market. And then 10 days later, there was a Pareto conference in Oslo and it was standing room only. And that was literally the, 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 the top of the interim top for the sector, which is only just recovering from now. Um, so I, 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 I'm afraid I, I rang, I rang, I, I rang a mini bell on the sector last September, but I'm, I'm hugely constructive on it right now. I really like it. I mean, alongside my, um, I prefer talking about my refiner trade because there are less people talking about it, but I, I, I love my offshore names. And I think that, um, I mean, I'm I'm not in. There's there, there, there's. Some, I mean, there are almost some tribal wars emerging about whether or not you prefer the Valaris story or the Transocean story. It's kind of like the Jocks and the Geordies. I mean, I'm in the kind of why not own, why not own both camp. I I understand um, the whole capital allocation argument. You know, rigs got to pay back an awful lot of debt before it can buy too much of its own stock whereas Valaris has got a clean a, a clean skin from a balance sheet perspective um i see merits in both stories and as in a world where so much of the market particularly in these names is um is is market neutral long short players and you know, there's a, there's a there are massive books of long Valaris short rig and vice versa you know you might as well own both and get a little bit less volatility. Um, but you know, I'm a big believer in 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 particularly for for mid cap outside of mega cap names. I'm, you know, it's the first screen right now. What what's the what, what what's this management team doing with its share count? Um, you know, I, I I do believe, and it's, it's kind of sad to have to admit that it's come down to that. But you know, unless there's a decent corporate bid for the stock it's going to str- it's it's going to struggle to 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 compete in value land and if it's if it's cheap and the company's buying back stock that is a accrues massively to shareholder value yeah if it's cheap and there's not a buyback you know maybe you'll yeah. get lucky but who knows yeah, well well you just you just have to be a very patient human being because yes. um you know you know it's I think I think I've stolen this from Louis Garve, right? Who's an old mate from Hong Kong. Um, there are three types of trade in the world. There's carry trades. Now, carry trades are for wealthy people with huge balance sheets that don't mind being no, don't mind being short vol, right? Because it's all very well, you know, borrowing in yen and being long Brazilian or Mexican short dated paper. That's great until one day. The moff in Tokyo wakes up and says, hey, "No mass," in terms of in terms of their currency weakness. Moff, Ministry of Finance, yeah. yeah, 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 Ministry of Finance. So, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I remember vividly um, the day that the Swiss franc depegged, right? And you know, a hundred thousand households in Poland saw their mortgage mortgage balance grow by thirty percent overnight because they'd been sold Swiss franc denominated mortgages. Um, in Poland, go figure that. Um, but you know, carries a carries a short vol trade. Let, never forget it. Um, momentum. Well, everything's momentum these days. But if you're a if you're a classically trained corporate financier, it feels a little bit dirty to be in a momentum trade. But you know, everyone's got to do it. And then there's mean reversion trades, and that is the value investor, right? And we do the work, and we do the numbers, and we. We, we, you know, we're right, 
but we can be wrong for a very long time. And I think the only way to protect yourself if you're a value investor these days, particularly in the mid cap space, is to see if see if the company's working for you too, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not just talking about operating the business well. I'm talking about actively impacting the register. So tell us about your basket of uh, United Kingdom mid cap stocks. Those stocks are cheap, but they have been cheap for for a while. What do you think is going to be a catalyst for them to for those shares to rise? And is the management of British mid caps, are they working for you in terms of buybacks, dividends? I'm, I'm a Brit that hasn't lived in the UK for a, a long period of time. But, you know, I, I, I operated as a, as a banker in London for years. Um, I mainly did um, overseas stuff while I was there. I didn't do a lot of domestic business, um, if, I'm, if I'm completely honest. But there was a spell when I did quite a lot, and particularly in the mid cap space. I mean, there's a lot of very well well-managed global businesses that sit in the FTSE 250. Um, and, you know, they're not necessarily hugely hung on the domestic economy, but as you go in, as you drop out of the FTSE 100 into the FTSE 250, you know, it's, it's more domestic. Um, now, my play on that, I mean, I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not stock picking UK mid caps, right? What I, my approach was, a much more macro approach, which was looking at the mid-cap investment trusts. Now, these are closed-end funds in the UK, um, and they have, you know, they are actively managed by blue chip, you know, the J.P. Morgans, the Black Rocks, the Aberdeens of this world. Um, they're managed by, you know, proper stock pickers that are meeting with management teams, you know, every quarter. And so I'm really happy to outsource that legwork to those guys. And I bought a bus basket of five, five of these UK investment trusts that are trading at double digit discounts to NAV. And the trust busters have come visiting the UK investment trust market as they do every every couple of decades. This time it's um, Saba Capital, it's Bose mm -hmm. Weinstein. Yep. Also, um, our friend our friend Paul Singer's back with the investment trust market, but he's he's not taking on the mid cap targets. He's come after Scottish Mortgage Trust, which, by the way, has got nothing to do with Scotland, nothing to do with mortgages, or nothing to do with Scottish mortgages. It's actually a it it, it basically looks quite a lot like Ark. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but it's trading uh, at a discount. That's trading at a discount. And so Singer's gone after those guys. But I was going for the, the UK mid cap play. I think, you know, UK mid caps have just got too cheap. And, um, you know, I am a little bit, a bit, bit worried about the sterling risk. Um, and, you know, but don't listen to me on, on, on sterling. Um, I, I'm, I'm a terrible trader of sterling. Um, but I, I just, I, I, I've just taken the view. I'm taking a, a classic sort of price is truth trend follower approach to um, hedging it. So I'm, I'm just looking at a simple 30 day, 50 day crossover um, on 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 cable on on US dollar GBP. Um, if um, if sterling is trending positively, I'll own the investment trusts unhedged. If it's negatively trending, I'll be, I'll be fully hedged up into dollars. Rupert, so so far, you know, we're 80 minutes into our conversation. We haven't talked about the Federal Reserve, interest rates, currencies, commodities. Uh, we've we've talked specific, a lot about specific industries, uh, tires, electric vehicles. We, we did talk about, about China, which is some, somewhat macro. But can you talk about the importance of doing uh, – industry level analysis or in some cases company level analysis to complement your macro uh, uh, framework because after all it is blind squirrel macro not blind squirrel micro so so tell us about the <laughs> macroeconomic work that you do that does accord with traditional you know what's the federal reserve going to do what's the dollar going to do that kind of stuff as well as how doing the industry level uh, uh, analysis complements your your macro framework it's about i spend over half my time looking at macro as a theme. I try not to write about it too much because it's um it's 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 a, it's a crowded it's a crowded and you and people like people like you do such a great job of getting off um getting getting intelligence speakers on to talk about what that fed speaker might be intimating or what that. I mean I, and I absorb it all, right? And ultimately 
it absolutely drives where I'm looking for themes, right? So I'm 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 looking to, you know, express my macro views with interesting themes. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I mean, listen, I don't have an analyst, I, I don't have a team of analysts sitting behind me, you know, pouring through 10Ks and 10Qs every day. So I, I have to take a sort of a slightly 50,000 foot approach to two themes. That's why invariably I will go with a basket of names rather than a name um, because directionally I feel more comfortable that I've, I've got a chance of getting it right. Um, in terms of where I am high level, um, I am in a, I'm in, I'm in the camp that we're in, in an inflationary world, right? So, um, I, I never, I, I never bought into the, 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 the three D's, um, that meant that deflation was our natural destiny. Um, I, you know, the, the, I mean, I, I, disagree with the premise that demographics is deflationary, right? I, I actually think a, a lot, awful lot of a, a smaller labor force and a lot of dependent um, old, pe- old people is, is, is inflationary. What about Japan? Well, 5.3% in the Shinto, um, this, you know, there, there's some inflation creeping into the system. That's the, um, I just, I learned this literally an hour ago preparing for this, but that's the, uh, the wage board where they it's negotiate a spring wage, wage negotiation. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a spring wage negotiation. But you know, well, that's the that's the that's the that 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 gets, that's the biggest uplift in 30, 35 years, thirty three years, something like that. Um, I um, I mean, the, the the only one that I still don't have a strong view on is is technology. I mean, is 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 artificial intelligence? You know truly going to change everything everything we do yeah i think it's i think it's really important i'm not going to do a sort of paul krugman fax machine type statement but you know and i certainly think it's you know it's no bueno when it comes to the indian ict sector for example right but um you know i've already been surprised just how um I've I've already already been surprised at you know just how easy it is to run in the wrong direction on this stuff. Um, I wrote a piece about the biotech sector the other day, um, and you know, let's be very clear: I am not a biotech expert. I have always outsourced my views. I mean, I I I, I, I spent a small period of time where I had a a very good healthcare team. When I was running capital markets for Jefferies in London, I had a very good healthcare team. But you know, doing um, doing capital raisings for um, phase two, phase three FDA biotech stocks it was a bit like a constant game of Russian roulette. You never knew when you were going to blow up your institutional <laughs> institutional clients with a with a with with, with a failed drug trial. Um, but you know. What I found extraordinary was that biotech had chronically underperformed since sort of AI hit investor consciousness with ChatGPT in whenever it was, November 22. Um, and the biotech industry has been using large language models. I mean, for 15 years, they've been talking about large language models and AI in, 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 in drug development. And I thought, you know, surely this is surely this is the big beneficiary but i think i think actually you know we are in a little bit of an everything rally but biotech has woken up for the first time in quite some time and i think that i mean i I, i've got a i've got a couple of my readers that are, are deeply in the weeds in the sector and they both got in touch with me after i wrote about it and said yeah it's it's really it's really happening this time and but it, sorry, we started on a, on infl- on a deflation yeah. topic on on this. I mean, is that necessarily deflationary, right? If we're going to be able to develop life changing drugs um, far more efficiently, isn't that going to extend working lives? Isn't that going to? I mean, so I mean, what I'm saying is that you know 
oversimplifying these things is inevitably a mistake. Um, and um, so that so macro. So inf- I'm 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 an, an inflation Easter. If I had to style myself, I try not to get too stuck in the weeds on this thing. I mean, there have been people that have been stubbornly stuck in the de- deflation camp um, for a very expensive few years, um, and. You know, some of them won't ever reform, but you know, I, you've got to be flexible in this game and intellectually flexible in this game. Um, I, you know, I do. Th- I'm I'm a commodity bull, which by definition probably means that I'm neutral, negative on the dollar um, as, a, as 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 a sort of base view, but you know, that's not that's not really a perfect view because you know, I'm actually pretty negative fiat currency and I'd rather own the dollar than most other fiat currencies. Um, I, I, I wrote a piece on, on gold last weekend and it's just always amazing. If you look at any asset class priced in gold, right? It's all been pretty atrocious, right? The traders do to be, to be short paper currencies long, long anything else. And, um, I think that generally this sort of rising tide for real assets is has to be at the top of your thinking all the time, right? And you know, I ultimately we're not all in a position to be able to walk into Jamie Dimon's office and get non-recourse leverage over a cash flow generating asset um, for a long period of time. Um, but you do want to be you you do want to be levered long, i.e. short the currency, levered long, levered long assets wherever wherever possible. Now, I'm not advocating that everyone should be opening margin accounts. Absolutely not, right? Because you Nor need to yeah. you need to you need to be you can't afford to be stopped out of these trades. It's a bit like the US homeowner, homeowner with their 30 year mortgage is in a fantastic position versus someone that can fix maybe for three or five years in the UK market or the Australian market. You can be stopped out of that trade. Now, there is one way you can get non recourse leverage at institutional pricing, and that's via the options market. And um, so, I mean, I, I write a lot about options, I have a derivatives background. Um, I'm not a quant. I mean, I did French and Spanish literature at university. I'm not a quant, but I, it was my job to translate what the French PhDs on my derivative trading desk were, um, structuring to, for my, for my corporate clients. I, I speak Greek, um, but I probably don't think in it by Greek. Sorry. I'm talking about option maths, yeah, not, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> not, not the language. You already had my friend the shrub on um, the other day. He, he's the one that actually speaks Greek. What I'm saying here is, is I mean, I, I already write a lot about options, and um, you know, I th- there's usually an option element to the basket baskets that I that that I put together, particularly if it involves sort of U.S. listed underlying stocks, because that's where the best best option market is. But the um, what I'm saying is that long dated. Vol is as cheap as it's ever been. Yes, higher rates of interest are baked into the forward price for assets right now, but you're not paying a credit spread on top of that. You're getting institutional. You're getting you're financing at the risk free rate via the option market. Yeah, Ro, Ro is not a. I don't speak Greek, but I can I can pretend to. Speak. <laughs> Ro, Ro, Ro's not a factor. Like no one's like Ro has been. A, Ro had been, which is the effect of interest rates on an option price, had been erased from collective consciousness mm-hmm. by by Zerp, right? And actually, I I, I wrote a piece um, with Scooby Doo on the cover just before Christmas, um, titled Ro, Ro um, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. I keep myself amused, Jack. Um, but the, um, you know, actually the premise around that was, um, not something that I advocate now cause I've, I've had a sort of Damascene conversion on being short risk of any, any, any sort right now. But the, um, I was just pointing out that, um, the price of an S and P a long dated S and P put was baking in 
a level of interest rates that probably isn't going to stay there for very long, right? Um, same thing on the flip side. I think that um, I, I think that vol at these levels, the interest rates are, are what they are. They're baked in, but having leverage on assets that you can't be stopped out of, you know, the, this is this is a smart way of getting short cash, short paper. So I don't disagree with you at all. Nor you know, I, w- I would dare disagree with you on the factual matter that long dated options allow people to get access to very cheap leverage, and instead of getting a margin borrowing at ten percent with their you know retail broker, they can borrow at you know with five and a half percent baked in, which you can't do unless you're a hedge fund or institutional client of, of a prime broker. But I also think it introduces complexity. You know, if you're you know, long, 120% long stocks, and you're using margin with that expensive 10% rate, it is a lot easier. You're just buying and selling as opposed to, you know, trading vol. Anytime you have an options position, you're trading vol. And trading vol is a totally different ball game from trading stocks or investing in stocks. And you have to roll them constantly. So you have to manage these things. It's not like you can just go to the beach, you know? There are some option strategies which you really can go to the beach, right? What I'm saying is that well, there are two things to think about. So let's let's deal with volatility first, yeah. right? I'm not saying that volatility can't go down further. Listen, I think that central bankers are full-time employed these days in the volatility compression game. They want the VIX down every day. They want the move index down every day. And they're winning. You're being treasury market. And they're, they're doing a really good job of it, right? Because the only thing that upsets the apple cart with respect to their game plan, I think, which is just to deflate away all of this debt that we've got. They only get away with that if there are no nasty surprises. So vol events, market events, massive risk off events are kryptonite for Janet Yellen and her friends, right? And so they are in the volatility suppression game. And so now I'm not saying that vol's going back up a lot right? Because there are too many vested interests that want to keep it down, right? And they understand how the system works. All I'm saying is that it's very, very cheap, right? And it's not where you're going to get undone, right? And the advantage of the non-recourse leverage, I used to call the option market the poor man's prime broker, right? The, the, you know, it, it, the advantage of the very cheap leverage outweighs your further downside risk in implied volatilities to my mind. Now, in terms of the active management point is that, let's say you pick the right assets to be levered long on via options, right? You start by perhaps buying a slightly out of money option, right? And over time, if you've made the right call and you pick the underlying asset, this option is going to behave more and more like a stock, right? You, you, you're, losing, you're losing your leverage to the upside, but you're also, you know, getting, 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 getting more volatility. Um, and so, yeah, active management to the extent that you're always keeping the leverage in the trade by, you know, you start with a stock at 100, you bought a, an option struck at 120 or 130, the stock moves up to 130, maybe you want to think about moving, rolling up your strike, maybe at the same time you push out a bit more maturity. Yeah, I wouldn't call that. Um, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of position management that I can manage on a 15-hour time difference, right? Mm-hmm. I just I just need to set a set an alarm occasionally to wake up for three three p.m. Eastern. So are these options entirely in uh, liquid products such as SPY or it, ETFs, um, sector ETFs? I mean, there you know, it's the option market is so liquid and so deep, right? Um, in the U.S., I'm talking. I mean, and 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 in, you know, you can get good execution in some. Um, in some European markets, but you know, options in Japan is a bit of a waste of time. Options down here in Australia is a bit of a waste of time. Um, ultimately, but with 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 the, with the sophistication of the ETF market now, you can get all sorts of global exposures. You know, you want you want 
look at the option chain in iShares Brazil, the EWZ, right? Trades like water. So these things, these things are very. So you're only talking about like index or ETF products that are extremely liquid, like not not an option on a single stock, which could be very well illiquid. I, I've got no issue with that. It's just I'm not really in the single stock recommendation game. I have my favorite children in my tire basket and in my refiner basket, but am I going to say, guys, you need to be in Philips sixty six above all? Yeah, you can probably tell from my note. Right. Yeah. I've picked on Goodyear as the stock in the basket to add a, an, an option element to. But there's a story behind that. There's the, there's the turnaround story related to the Elliott activism and the new CEO. But, you know, the, the same rule applies, Jack, in terms of, um, you know, I mean, if it's a large enough single stock, you can, I mean, if, if you look at the, if you look at the Microsoft option chain, or you look at the Exxon Mobil um, option chain, you can you can absolutely do the same thing. Absolutely, I, Rupert. My point was only if someone uh, is trading a a not a a tiny stock that no one's ever heard of, but a stock that's not Apple or Nvidia, and they have a long dated option position on that, and they want to roll their option, the the spread might be you know nine dollars and twenty cents. Ten dollars and fifty cents. In that case, that's going to take their entire day to trade, and they might have a you know they probably have a, have a job that maybe it's not in finance. So just people should be aware of when you say it's easy, it's easy for you because you're a pro. And you know if people aren't a pro, they shouldn't assume that it's going to be as easy for them as it is for a pro such as yourself or shrubs. You know. Yeah, I mean, but listen, even if you are even if you are trading um, options on XLE, right? You're not going to want to put it in a market order, right? I mean, any. Um, to be honest, I think anyone that's trading options in their own account, right, has already sort of self-qualified for a certain degree of financial literacy and sophistication. And and if you've got that degree of financial literacy and sophistication, you're not putting in a market order on an option, right? Because you're just making Ken Griffin richer if you do that. Right, and that's, I'm, I'm I'm talking to people who would do that and i'm saying don't if you don't know don't that, do that don't, don't do, do not it. do that no, don't be you the put an order in it. you put an order in at mid yeah. and you have to sit there and watch it and move it a penny there five cents there until you get filled at a fair price absolutely yeah. there we go uh rupert final thoughts on gold which for the longest time has done absolutely nothing as you know all the gold bulls just get more more bullish on it now that every all the gold bulls have you know kind of been you know, too embarrassed to talk about it publicly. Now is the time that it shoots up. So what are your thoughts on that? And then also the fact that the gold miners, which, you know, they mine something which has gone up in, in price immensely over the past two months, let's say, they haven't seemed to catch a bit at, at all. What's going on there? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm the original WhatsApp chat where Blind Squirrel Macro was born was alive with gold bug gold bag chatter over over the weekend um uh, they can't they can't believe that i am not um tooting the horn for the miners well first point on gold actually as a u.s investor u.s saver yeah it's been pretty boring for the last couple of years but try telling a chinese or a japanese or an australian holder of gold you know they're they're they're, they're dealing with rotator cup injuries from fist pumping because they've done so well on their gold investments Fair enough. I think the, the broader point is that everything else has underperformed, and particularly cash has underperformed relative to gold. Yes, we've finally got the explosive new all-time high breakout, and yeah, it's great, and I'm long, and I'm excited for the gold bulls. I really am. What I was saying in my note over the weekend is that I'm not so sure that the, the, the miners, the precious metal miners stocks follow the precious run because I think that a lot of this buying of this recent buying of gold is from the predominantly Asian central banks, right? If you look at the shares outstanding in the GLD ETF as a proxy for retail ownership in gold, it's just been going down in a straight line since the peak during the, the COVID summer of 2020. One thing that Asian central banks don't do is, well, not since the 16th century have they bought silver. And the other thing that they certainly don't do is buy Newmont Mining or Barrick Gold, right? And so ultimately, 
what you are counting on is that the move in gold attracts the institutional FOMO crowd who can't buy GLD because they're stock pickers, aren't they? So they so they buy Newmont or they buy Barrick. And if they're a bit more aggressive, they buy GDX. And if they're even more aggressive, they buy GDXJ. And if they're even more aggressive, they buy 30 Delta call options on DXJ, um, GDXJ, rather. Um, and I'm just not so sure that that cycle plays out if the starting point is a different type of buying, all right? And so, but you can still get leveraged on that gold trade. Guess where? The auction market. (laughs) Your favorite. (laughs) (laughs) Guess guess where? It all brings us back to options. No, but uh, that that was basically the, the point of my note. The other thing is with the miners, I went through this exercise. I mean, I love, I love Fred Hickey and I've subscribed to him, his high-tech strategist for years. And there's nothing that he doesn't know about the operations and reserves and gold and silver miners. And he will pick the ones that make the most money in this cycle, without a doubt. The question for me is whether or not they end up being great stocks. Now, I went through the entire universe of gold and silver miners in the GDX and the GDXJ ETFs the other day, and I dumped them in and just looked at, I sort, sorted the 150 names by buyback yield. Yeah, we're back to buybacks, Jack. Only 10 of the 150 names had a positive buyback yield on a trailing 12-month basis. The thing about miners is when they make the money, what do they want to do? They want to dig another hole, right? And I don't think that the capital allocation memo has has got to these mining stocks yet, which means that, you know, aside from a bit of a flourish of FOMO that we might be seeing right now since the beginning of the March, we've seen a big catch, catch up trade by the miners. But if you look at a longer dated chart of just GLD versus GDX, right? They've been lagging for a while, right? And they've really only just woken up in the last cup, you know, last last month, basically. And so, you know, I'm, I'm is this is this going to be our fathers or our grandfathers' um, precious metal bull runs? I don't think so, right? I think I think that gold is a great asset right now. And I think the right kind of people are buying it. If central bankers are buying it, you know, they're bigger than anyone else. That's great news. You want to be buying what they're buying, not what your grandpa used to buy during this cycle. Now, when I first started in the industry in the early nineties, we used to, we used to joke with our, you know, our friends, parents who were, you know, gold bugs have been around since, (laughs) since, since, since markets existed. And we always used to, um, we always used to joke about our friends, parents that were, you know, reading, reading whatever the 19, 1980s, early 1990s version of, of high tech strategists was. And we used to tease them. Um, and we have, we are now in our fifties and we're buying gold stocks as well. (laughs) In, U.S. terms, I guess, I mean, the 1930s, I guess, but you couldn't really own it. But, I mean, gold had a tremendous bull run from 1971 or 73 to to 1981. But then bear market, brutal bear market from the 80s to 2000, bull market from 2000 to 2013. Don't worry, it still existed. It still existed as a as a religion throughout that bear, throughout that bear market. You know, listen, I was in short trousers during the 1970s, so I lived through a time where the union bosses were household names, right? And I think we are. I was I was pointing out the other day, and I'm oh, I'm forgetting his name, Sean Fain, who's yep, the yep. head of the UAW. Um, he was, I mean, same weekend as the Oscars come out, um, um, Motor Trend has their personalities of the year, the top 100, 100 people in global auto. And number one pick for 2024 was Sean Fain of Makes the United sense. Auto Workers Union. Now, I think we could well be entering a phase whereby um, the union bosses are once again household names. That was also a pretty good time for gold. Yes, and so you you are an inflationist. Uh, Rupert, thank you so much for for coming on. We, we've gone 
way longer, but that, you know, the conversation has just been, been really good. Talked on a, a, a wide array of topics. People can find you on Twitter at, uh, squirrel me, squirrel macro. macro and their, your sub stack. They can find you at uh, blind squirrel macro.com. Rupert, uh, thanks so much for coming on and thanks everyone for watching. No, thank you, Jack. That was great. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL.